So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kathy Davis and I'm the education consultant for KET and today's session is how our government works, helping your students become informed citizens. Here is a bit.ly for the slide presentation today if you would like it, but I also put the full link. Uh, some people have been saying they can't get the bit.ly links. So uh, I put the full link in the chat. So please uh, feel free to uh, use this in any way that helps you uh, with teaching this subject area. Uh, this is my email address and my Twitter. Uh, so please, if you have questions after the session or uh, I can help in any way, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, today's session, like I said, is a, basically we're going to cover a lot of good election resources and civic resources. Uh, this week, we've been having a lot of fun with the Bitmoji classroom, so I just created this one real quick about to show how patriotic I really am, and I do. I vote every year, and here are some good resources that I put up for you guys that these are all linked out to these resources so you can go back and look at these at any time with the slides. Uh, the goal for today's webinar is to explore resources to teach students about how our government works, the election process, and most importantly, resources that help our students become informed, responsible citizens. So, uh, the first thing we're going to talk about today, I hope everyone that is on the call is familiar with PBS Learning Media, but I want to give a quick little tour of it in case there are some folks on here that aren't real familiar with it. Um, as I have already said, these slides, everything in these slides are linked. So, if you have questions. Okay, uh, so um, all of the resources on here are um, linked uh, to the resources. So I'm going to go out now to PBS Learning Media. And this is what PBS Learning Media looks like. Uh, you can, it, we have thousands and thousands of resources on here for you to use. Um, you can do just a standard word search. You can search by subjects, grades, standards. It has a student view that you can also use. And it, I'm going to real quickly show you guys in, in case you don't have an account, because you will need to create an account. Uh, this little memo message I've got up here about the new schools routines, we're going to view that collection in just a moment. And I would not be getting that message if I was not logged into my account. Also, you can see here under my name is I can, once I have an account, I can create favorites. Once I have favorites, I can put those into folders. Uh, I can create classes, which if you have Google Classroom, that's probably not something you need. And then it's also got a tools feature with some cool things. So I'm going to show you guys how easy it is to create an account. So I'm just going to log out. And as you can see, all of those features went away for me. So if you don't have an account yet, you just click sign up and you can sign up through your Google account. And that's how most educators now are doing it. So if you just hit, hit Google, it will put in your Google username and you can go and create an account with just in a matter of seconds. Uh, you can also uh, sign up through an email account. Uh, one thing I do want to say, however you create your original account, that's what you will want to stick with because they don't, like if you have one that you created through Google and one, one through email, they don't like transfer your favorites and stuff real good. So create one account and stick with it. I created my account long before signing in through Google was an option. So I have an email account. So I am going to... Let me go back here. That's not what I meant to do. If you sign up through email, that's what it looks like. But I already have an account. And so I'm just going to sign back in here uh, through my email. And it is saved into my computer. So I can just sign back into my Google account. OK, and as you can see, again, my name appears. So I am ready to go. So that was a quick overview of PBS Learning Media. I'm going to show you some more features as we go along, but be sure and sign up for a free account. The account is totally free. And then once you favor and create folders and stuff, you will have those indefinitely. You can have those the rest of your teaching career, hopefully. 
Okay, so I am going to go back to uh, the slides now. And I'm going to go out of that and go back to the slides. So this is a collection. It's called 2020 um, Elections. And it is a toolkit that they created. And uh, w one thing I want to say, another reason to have an account, they're going to create more of these toolkits throughout the year. And you will get notices when they create a toolkit if you have an account. So I'm going to go down through here and I'm just going to kind of show you guys and I'm going to close out of a few things here. This is blocking my screen and I'm just going to show you guys uh, the way this is set up. This is a new schools routine because of the way things changed in March of 2020. And so they have gone in and they have created uh, some good resources here for you can use. What we're going to talk about today is the new schools routines because it has a special section called elections and civics. So that's the reason I'm talking about it so much today. I do want to real quickly, because I may have some folks on here, a lot of my resources today are for the older grades, uh, but I do have, do want to show you a few resources along the way uh, for the younger grades. So if you go in here, to um, the bingo part of this, you will see they have created bingos uh, for the younger grades uh, for every week uh, from now till whenever this particular toolkit closes. And I wanted to show you guys uh, real quickly, they have one they've created, a let's vote bingo. And so if you go into that, it will give you everything. This particular one is for first and second grade, and it will give you all the resources that you need to carry this out. And so we're going to go in and look at it real quickly. And I thought it was kind of cool, the little bingo card that they have. So you can have your use this with your students and like through the week, you poll your family members, which do they like more, broccoli or tomatoes? Uh, make a let's vote sign, write a letter to the president, make a ballot box. So you can see there are several uh, things in here uh, that your students can do, uh, which is kind of cool for the young ones to just kind of show them what an election is about. So I just wanted to show that real quickly for my younger grades. Uh, and we're going to go ahead now, and I want to sh also show a few features real quickly while we're here. Uh, if you have an account with PBS Learning Media, all you have to do is to share this out. If you want to use this with your students, you can share it out to your Google Classroom with the touch of a button here. Uh, you can also look for your support materials here, and then I'll talk to you guys about favoring resources. You can make it a favor by touching the little heart and it turns the heart blue. And then when I go up here to my favorites, then this is going to be in my favorite. So I don't have to go back out and try to find it again. So I am going to go back. I just wanted to show that for the, the if there's anyone on here that are teaching the younger grades. And then I'm gonna go to the uh, teacher planning kits. Right now, there's just the one, but like I said, there's going to be several more throughout the school year. So we're going to go into that. They put it in document form. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to view this. And so when you view this, and I am having to change my thing back and forth because it's blocking my way. Uh, when you view this, you will see that the upcoming webinars, this one came from the September 17th webinar. Uh, there's going to be four more throughout the course of this school year. And I'm sure since the, the topic this month, because elections are coming up, was elections. And I'm sure they'll have a special collection depending on uh, what's going on that time of year. Uh, you can go, uh, here's how you can see these are valuable resources. You can get in the PBS Teachers Lounge. And that's a site that has lots of good blog information for you. And if you want to go back and watch the webinar that you missed on September 17th, you can go back here 
and watch it. That's totally up to you. And if you do have an account, then when they get ready to have the, when's the next one? November the 12th one, uh, they will send you a notice that it is about to come up and then you can watch it. And it shows you what else in the toolkit, the planning kit, but I wanna go because today we're concentrating on elections and civic participation. So I want to show you as you go down through here, it is broken down into grade levels and all of these are linked out to really cool uh, sites that you can go to uh, to teach your students uh, civics and the election. I have pulled, the, I found two or three things in here that I really like. And so I have pulled those out and made individual slides with those. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the resources more uh, from the slides. So check that out, get you an account and ten, attend these webinars as they are having them and make use of these uh, great toolkits that they are putting out. So I'm going to go on. And while we're on the subject of PBS Learning Media, I wanna share a few collections uh, with you guys that um, are really good, that I really like in PBS Learning Media. This particular one is called Above the Noise. And once again, I hate to be redundant, but I wanna point out that you can share this. If you find something on here that you want your students to have in their Google Classroom, you can share it with a, with a push of a button or you can favorite, or you can share it out to social media or different platforms, Remind, Facebook, or whatever that you're using with your students. And as you can see, this collection has a whole collection within a collection on COVID-19 and Gen Z. Uh, which is very timely uh, right now. So you might wanna go back and check that out. I have got it uh, defaulted to elections and civics because that's our topic today. And as you can see here, there are some topics that our older students would really be interested in. I want to, just to give you a flavor for how these are done, here is a video on how can we get more young people to vote, which we all know that's a problem. So I'm just gonna show a few seconds of this. Uh, if uh, if one of my colleagues, if you guys if you're not there, you're gonna let me know. I remember the first time I voted, I was 18. Me and my mom, we walked down to the polling place. And I mean, on our way there, she's literally telling everybody that we're walking past that it's her baby's first time to vote. She's taking pictures before we voted, while we're voting, which I'm pretty sure is illegal, and even after we're voting. And I'll just never forget that. And I voted in every election since. In 2019, for the first time ever, millennials, which includes yours truly, will surpass the baby boomers as the largest voting bloc in the US. And with that, comes a lot of power, especially since there's so much at stake in the 2020 election. The thing is, people under 30 tend not to vote nearly as much as people over 30, or like over 45 if we're really being honest. But if we don't vote, it means election results may not actually reflect what the largest generation of people actually want. Yikes. So, why don't younger generations vote as much as older people do? Okay, and I know you guys can watch this video on your own, and I hope that you could see it and hear it uh, good. Uh, we, um, and he goes on to explain why the gen younger generations do not vote and give suggestions on how maybe we can get the younger generation to vote. I also want to point out that these are aligned to standards. Again, you can favor, these have support materials. A lot of them have good discussion questions. Some of them have quizzes already made up and stuff. So always check the support materials. Uh, when you're watching things on PBS Learning Media or using uh, resources on PBS Learning Media. And some of you guys, it may be helpful to know that a lot of the videos, this particular one is not, but you can watch them in Spanish as well. And you can download if you're having an internet, if internet's an issue or whatever. Uh, so that is Above the Noise. I just wanted you guys to see that collection. Uh, so I'm gonna go on now to another collection that I really like in PBS Learning Media, and it's called the U.S. Presidency. And we'll go into it. And when I say collection, what collections are is they have taken a lot of like resources on the same topics, and they have put them into all together so that you can go to collections and find things uh, that would be uh, what you might like. 
Uh, as you can see, one of the favorite resources that we have that we get a lot of comments in PBS Learning Media is on 60 Second Presidents. And it takes every president and in 60 seconds, it tells you in a fun way, uh, basically uh, all the facts about that president uh, that your students might need to know. And as you can see, these are all in Spanish as well. So check these out. They're pretty cool because you can learn a lot of information in 60 seconds. Uh, but you can also, as you see, it has um, information on campaigns and elections, speeches, first ladies. Uh, it has teacher's guides on a lot of the uh, presidents, not all of them, but some. And then here's some Ken Burns uh, information as well, uh, some resources that Ken's, Ken Burns has created. Uh, so check out the, the U.S. presidency. It's a pretty cool collection to use, uh, especially at this time of year. And then also, I want to point out Election Central. Uh, this is another collection that has a lot of resources in it that might help you teach about presidents, the election process, civics, how voting works. I'll talk a little bit about news media literacy in just a few moments because in teaching civics and the election, we really need to teach news media literacy as well. But I just wanted to point this out. And like I said, these are linked in the slides so that you can go back and look at these later. And I have pulled out some of the resources that you are seeing as well. I fixed a slide for both of these resources because I really like both of those resources. So we're gonna go back now. And um, this is one of those resources that I talked to you about. This is a contest if you're interested in having your students to do this, I have it linked. It's with KQED, which is the Northern California PBS station. And it is basically, you can also, if you're interested in using media with your students and your students creating media, you can go here and see all the things that students have actually created. And there's some really, really cool ones in there. Uh, but if you to participate in the challenge, here's what you need to know as teachers, but I wanna go to the student site to just kind of show you what your students uh, will be doing. So basically it, it's got good information on um, how to write a, get a great co uh, commentary. And that's what they're going to be doing. First of all, they are going to watch some so they kind of know what they're doing and what's expected of them. And then step two, they just choose a topic. And I thought it was very interesting. If you click on this, it shows what they are saying when students were polled. These are the top five things in 2020 uh, that matter to students. Uh, and, and I thought it was quite interesting, climate change, gun legislation, immigration, college affordability, and abortion and reproductive legislation. Uh, so that's something that, and they want students to, to choose something that is relevant now. And then they just get started writing their commentary. Uh, it has to be, the script should be 400 words or less. And here is lots of great resources for them to use. Uh, when they're trying to get started on writing their commentary. And then they have to make a recording. It can either be a video or audio uh, commentary recording. And I really love that it gives them all of these softwares that they can use. And those, uh, for I think all of those are free and tutorials on how to use them. And um, then they just go to the dashboard and they submit uh, what they have created. Now it is important to say that they cannot submit without, um, without a teacher signing off on it. So if you wanna show this to your students, if some of them are interested in it, it'd be a great uh, thing for them to do uh, to, um, to actually be involved. And if you're talking about great hands-on learning, this would be uh, fantastic. So check that out if you're interested. If you have any questions, just email me. And then also I found, this is not in PBS Learning Media, but I really, really like this resource. This is called Teachers First. And they have kind of done what, um, PBS Learning Media has done, they put together a whole list of resources for you to use with your students to help you teach about the election. 
And I did this the same way as I did the PBS learning media stuff. I pulled out and made separate slides for several of these that I like. But as you can see, there's 24 of these resources for you to check out. So please go in and check those out. I found some really uh, good stuff in there as I was trying to um, put this together. Uh, so I'm going to go back because, like I said, I pulled out some of the things and I'm going to show you some of those. Uh, the one thing I found in there that I really like was Vote Smart 2020 Facts Matter. And so um, this is what, uh, let me see, let me go back and let me exit this. There you go. Sorry about that, guys. I clicked on the wrong button. So, uh, this is what this site looks like. Um, and it, it really, really will cause your students to think. And I'm very hesitant to talk about the presidential election because it is so heated. But I just want to show you what the students can choose congressional races. And it just asks them for their state if they choose congressional or they can choose presidential. And when they choose this, it comes up with the four candidates that um, they have the option to vote for uh, this presidential election. And then across the top, it has all of the different hot topic issues uh, that you may be interested in. And you might want to, as a teacher, you might want to go through these and do this yourself because I found it to be quite interesting. Uh, so, for example, if you choose education, education tab, it will ask you questions. Do you support requiring states to adopt? If I say yes, you can see real quickly, and I'm not saying what my actual views are. I'm just showing you guys an example. It will show you more than likely these are the two candidates that you would you would want to vote for. And if this is very important to me, I can hit this is very important and it's going to keep showing me. So I can go up here and I can say national security. Should the United States use military force in order to prevent? And then you can read the question. And if I say not, depending on what I say, my candidates are going to get bigger or smaller about who I should vote, uh, who I should um, who I agree with most to vote with. And as you can see, how important is national security to you? And I say it's very important. And my different candidates uh, get bigger or larger, and it shows who I agree with or views the most. So if I go up here to a very controversial subject, and I'm just doing this one because I know it's going to change, uh, it, do you generally support pro choice or pro life? If I say pro life, then as you guys can see, my and this is very important to me, uh, my Republican candidate there got larger as I'm doing this. And so you can have your students and they can go right here to more details and read about each one of these and the different candidates, what they say about them and things. Uh, but if they do each one of these, then it should be a predictor of kind of who they agree with uh, the most. So I'm going to um, let's see. Well, hmm. well, guys, I'm going to have to stop sharing and go back in and share again because it is. Hung on that. There it goes. Okay, sorry. I thought it was hung on that screen. It was just wanting me to X out of that screen. My foul. My fault. So that's a, a kind of a cool resource that you can use with your students. Also, if you want to do a uh, mock ele election with your students, here's a really good site that you can go to. And another reason I pulled this out is because all the organizations that put this together. There are also links to them at the bottom, and I found some of these to have some very good information on them, especially working with young people, the Youth Leadership Initiative. If you go to it and go to their site, you can see that for teachers and visitors, that they have lots of good information here that you guys can use. They have lesson plans, 
uh, e-Congress mock elections, and then here a freedom wall where your students can voice uh, their concerns on uh, current issues and stuff. So I just wanted to point that out uh, in that, that I thought that was really good uh, thing that you guys can use um, with your students. So this is Teachers First, and like I said, check out all of these resources because there's a lot of them. I was really proud to see that PBS Learning Media or PBS News Hour made the list is what they thought was one of the great resources to use. So check those out. And then I'm going to go ahead. And uh, this is a video that I actually found uh, and looking at one of the sites, I forget which, and I'm not going to show the entire thing, but I really like the way that it uh, explains the electoral college because that's difficult for some students to. So I'm just going to play this for just a few minutes. I don't have time to play the entire thing. And let me point out, this is a TED Ed and most of their stuff is really good. Most people have heard of the Electoral College during presidential election years. But what exactly is the Electoral College? Simply said, it is a group of people. Kathy, each I'm sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your screen. Of the United States. So you, you can't see the screen, Amy? No, ma'am, it doesn't look like you're sharing your screen at all. We just see oh. our video participant boxes. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. I will go, try to uh, go back in then and share. Did it go out a minute ago when I hit that? That's that's what happened. Okay, so I'm going to share again. Thank you, Amy, for letting me know that. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Now we can see it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And I'm going to go in and start the video again. Most people have heard of the Electoral College during presidential election years. But what exactly is the Electoral College? Simply said, it is a group of people appointed by each state who formally elect the president and vice president of the United States. To understand how this process began and how it continues today, we can look at the Constitution of the United States. Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the Constitution. It specifies how many electors each state is entitled to have. Since 1964, there have been 538 electors in each presidential election. How do they decide on the number 538? Hmm. Well, the number of electors is equal to the total voting membership of the United States Congress, 435 representatives plus 100 senators and three electors from the District of Columbia. Essentially, the Democratic candidate and Republican candidate are each trying to add up the electors in every state so that they surpass 270 electoral votes, or just over half of 538 votes, and win the presidency. So how do states even get electoral votes? Each state Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause that and uh, you guys can watch that with your students. It has lots of good information uh, that will help your uh, students uh, understand all of it. In fact, as I was watching it, I learned some things myself. Uh, now I'm gonna go, since we kind of know what it is, we're gonna go to a decoder now, and this is actually found in PBS Learning Media. And this particular um, screenshot that I pulled up here is the election of 1976. Does anybody wanna take a guess? Uh, unmute yourself and tell me what election you think this is. And as you can see, these are the Republican votes and these are the Democrat votes. Has anybody got a guess of which election that is? Okay, so I, yeah, I don't guess we do. I don't have my uh, full. Okay, thank you, Sarah. She said it's the Ford election. Uh, Carter and Ford, Kenton said. Okay, great. So we're going to go in. 
And we are going to look at this resource and the kids, uh, I think you guys are really going to like this and the kids uh, will as well. So we're going to go ahead and explore elections. And as you can see, it starts uh, here with Washington and Adams and you can drag across and you can see each election election as it is uh, how that particular particular election played out. You can do it in the cartogram view that shows, um, gives them an idea that the, even though a, a state has more, its electoral votes is, depends on the population and not the geographic size, but you can go, if it makes more sense to your students, you can do it this way as well. And we can go on up through here and we can see through the course of the election how each one did. And we can go all the way to the end and it will bring up the 2020 election and it will let your students go and decide who they think uh, will win the election uh, state by state. And then once they have completely filled it out, they can save it. And then election night or two weeks later, or whenever we know how this all turns out, then they can see how well they did. And like I said, you can go to these different sites so that they know more about the views and why they're choosing and why they think what the swing states are and all those kind of things. So if you click on, let's just go to Kentucky, we'll click on it once. Uh, if we, of course, have eight electoral votes, and so if we uh, click on it once, uh, President Trump gets our vote or gets our eight. If we click on it twice, Joe B Vice President Joe Biden gets our vote, and then third party is the third one. And those were the two uh, obscure candidates. Uh, that I showed you all earlier. They don't even actually have them listed here. Uh, but, and then you can, the fourth time it can go back. So the students can go in and it shows here like Montana only has three votes, even though it's geographically very large because of its population. And you can see that if you go back to the cardiogram. Okay, so this is a kind of cool thing to play with that I think that you guys might want to fill it out. I'm going to fill it out and save it and see how I do uh, when uh, it all is said and done. Uh, but this is this is actually found in PBS Learning Media and I have it uh, linked uh, in the slides. So check that out. Pretty cool resource. And then this, I'm not going to show this video, but this is something that actually uh, Larry, a colleague of mine, found at U of L's um, and some stuff he was looking for as we were studying, trying to find good news media literacy stuff. And uh, this is a really good video that helps students understand that they need to read quality news when they're researching about the candidates. They, then they need to research them, not just listen to what someone else says. And then how important this particular video pulls out how important the money in campaigns are and how much money has be, is being spent in the elections. Uh, so it's a pretty cool, I stuck it in here for you guys in case you want to use it with your students. Here is a site that I really like. It's a civics online reasoning. And this has some really good stuff that you can use with your students about uh, civics and the election and government and, uh, and news media literacy. Uh, so you can go to the videos tab and as you can see here, um, how to find better information by click restraint. And basically what that is, is when you do a Google search on something, don't just look at the first thing that pops up. In fact, the first thing that pops up might actually be a paid advertisement uh, by someone. So go down, look at the sources, and find something that is a reliable source and check those out. And another good thing to use with your students as they're talking about click restraint is lateral reading. Don't just open one tab, the first thing you see, open that tab and read straight down. Find several of what you think are good sources and then read across, have all three tabs open and read across. Uh, so those are two things that, and these videos are really good, short, kind of entertaining videos 
uh, that will teach your students about that. And then one thing I really feel like I need to say is on using Wikipedia wisely. A lot of our students, that's the first thing they go to because a lot of times that's the first thing that pops up. Uh, Wikipedia now, they are saying, is a good resource to look at because it has evolved a lot over the years. So now for the most part, important articles like the 2020 election, you have to be a uh, uh, certified, for lack of a better word, Wikipedian in order to make changes and stuff. But one thing this points out that I think is really important to tell your students, every time that you uh, there's an edit made in Wikipedia, uh, they have to go in and cite their sources. So if you go to an article and then go down to the very bottom of that article, uh, you will find lots of good sources to check out what it is that you're wanting to research. So uh, Wikipedia is, um, like I said, it's getting a better name than it used to have. Uh, so this is a really good video to show your students on good use, uh, wise use of uh, Wikipedia. So I am kind of going through that a little fast because we are, um, the time is getting away from me as it always does, but definitely check out Civics Online Reasoning. Really good resources in there. It's it's one of my favorite things I've shown you guys today. And then uh, Common Sense Media. Uh, a lot of you guys probably already use this, but I just wanted to kind of show you guys uh, what is available in Common Sense Media on uh, the election. There's some really good stuff in here as there is in every subject. If you're teaching digital citizenship in your classroom or news media literacy, definitely check out this site. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that one in just a moment. But as you can see, there's nine ways to learn about state local elections, the things to check before you share news, our political ads selling the truth. And then there's some really good um, resources down here. I like this one. Um, eight ways you can make a difference in the election, even if you can't vote. Uh, I like this one uh, because most of you guys are working with students that can't vote yet. And it talks to them about how to uh, amplify the issues that are important to you, research them, know your facts, and then amplify those through different ways. Work for your local campaigns, nudge your teachers to talk more about these issues. Uh, text with purpose. So what you put out there on social media and it's got good websites to go to Republican and Democrat. And then uh, join a phone bank. So lots of different things. Uh, I think I skipped it, drive folks to the polls. Uh, go out and get people and drive them to the polls that can't go. So if you're interested in the election, there is lots of ways that you can get involved. And as you can see by reading the titles, Common Sense Media just has a lot of really good resources uh, for teaching um, civics, the election, uh, digital citizenship, uh, anything basically in that area. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I pulled out that one slide because I thought it was really good. Uh, this is, is on here and I link this to the activity, but this is basically, um, I'll, I'm going to go actually go into it so I can show you a little bit better. But this is basically all of the sites that they like to use and how they are doing uh, with um, trying to to tell the truth, to get the truth out there. So as you can see at the bottom, it looks like YouTube is doing the best, I will have to say. And it looks like Facebook might be doing the worst. Even in fact, uh, TikTok is not doing too badly there. Uh, but you can go and you can click on whatever social media platform and you can see what their policies is, what they are doing. And how so that was, I think that's pretty interesting. And I want to show you guys uh, something here also. Uh, back in my slides, uh, if we go to the next slide, and you guys just saw how much truth is going out on these uh, social media platforms. Um, I did a news media literacy workshop with a group of juniors in high school uh, last week. And this, I did a little poll, a little Slido poll, and had them to 
type in where they like to get their breaking news. And I also told them they could enter more than one answer because we all like to get our news in more than one place, or I know I do. And this is what came up, which does, you guys work with students, this doesn't surprise you at all, but Facebook and Instagram are doing very little to make sure that their news is actually the truth, and that's where most of our students are getting their news. So we need to talk with them about reliable news sources and where to get their news. I was kind of impressed that several of them, actually this was a school that's not too far from Louisville, um, and as Sarah said, this is pretty frightening. Yes, it really is. And this was a great group of students. They were very interactive and answered a lot of uh, things correctly when I would ask them about sources and stuff. Uh, so, yes, it is frightening, but I, I don't think it's a shock to anyone uh, that we know that, that this is where students are getting their news. So on that note, um, I, like I said, I, right now my whole life is being consumed with news media literacy. I used to be a media specialist before I took this position and I love news media literacy. So I've been doing a ton of research on it and creating workshops and stuff on it. And uh, this is a slide I use with the students and I think it's, um, <laughs> thank you, Becky, that is so true. It's not just the students, it's the adults as well. Uh, in fact, I'm amazed at what some of my teacher friends uh, put on Facebook. I'm like, oh, stop it. But anyway, and so this is a method to te teach your students. It's SIFT, an acronym S-I-F-T. And to kind of make it hit home with your students, uh, I put this illustration. It's kind of like when you go to festivals or like uh, places that have the little bags of dirt that you buy, and then you put it in a sifter, and then you swish it around in the water, and then all the great things come to the top. Um, and, and they do, and you can get some really uh, beautiful things uh, when you buy those little bags. And so, uh, just a way to explain to your students that news is kind of like that. You just, there's a whole bag full of dirt out there. And if you stop, when you first read something, just stop and think about, uh, does it sound too sensational to be true? Uh, does it look too sensational to be true? So just stop and think about the news that you've just read. And then investigate the source, as we've talked about uh, as we've been going through this stuff. Investigate your source. Do some lateral reading. See if the source you read it on agrees with the other sources and stuff. And then find trusted coverage. Uh, we all know uh, misinformation is probably spread everywhere. In fact, I probably spread it and don't realize I do, but we know the sources that try for news journalism and, and standards and try to, to, to put out the correct information. So have them define trusted coverage and then trace back to the original. Uh, I like the example here. Maybe there's a video. This is one that your students would understand. Uh, how much has been stripped from the original? Are they trying to make you see it a different way than it actually happened? Like, for example, there's a video of a fight between two people with person A as the aggressor. But what happened before that? What was clipped out of the video to make it look like that person A was the aggressor? So... Teach your students shift and hopefully uh, they will, this acronym will stick with them and this example will stick with them and they will try to find uh, good news. So uh, this, uh, that concludes the presentation.